I think, yeah, I think she wanted me to use it. Well, good morning. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for joining us. I believe we're the first one this morning, so super exciting. Appreciate everybody coming in. I'm actually going to let each of our uh, panelists introduce themselves this morning. So, Don, we can start with you. Okay. I just wasn't sure if that mic was on. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Don Archery, and I work with a company called Element Architects. Um, I've been a registered designer doing restaurant design for the last about 38 years. Um, I started with that firm about a year and a half ago and started developing their interiors department. I'm excited to be here and talk with you all on the panel this morning. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Sean McGinnis. I'm with uh, Sargenti Architects. We're a nationally uh, based uh, architecture firm working specifically with restaurant groups and retailers uh, throughout the world. Uh, my background has always been in food and beverage, either working in a restaurant, uh, working on the operations side, working in culinary and food innovation but I like building stuff. I've done everything in this industry except own my own restaurant, so for any of the operators in the room, hats off to you. I really uh, am empathetic and appreciative of what you all do. And it's great shaking everyone's hand. Excited to be back on the conference circuit. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us today. My name is Brian Podcheck. I'm the COO of Integrated Viral Protection, or IVP Air. I've been with, uh, I have, my background is about 20 years in medical device space about 30 years in food, food manufacturing. I own a consumer packaged goods brand as well. But I'm here today to speak to you about indoor air quality uh, through in integrated viral protection and how that looks for us today and in the incoming future. Beautiful. And I believe you have a short video you wanted to show? Well, actually, they weren't able to uh, get the video uh, going, but uh, we can just progress on. And when you're ready, I can run through the slides. Okay. Or some slides, yes. Perfect. Well then, Sean, I'm going to go ahead and start it off with you this morning, actually. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. So, <laughs> what's the best use of practical design you've seen in the last year or so for a restaurant? The, the best use of practical design, I wouldn't say uh, putting up plex panels between seats, uh, but that was just the nature of the, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, what, what I'm seeing a lot with people that already have built environments is how they can create better access for their third-party delivery and for their consumer. I, everyone wants to still dine in. I don't think that's ever going to go away, but we have to look at other consumers, the consumer being third-party delivery. They're never going away either. And I often recommend to the restaurant groups I work with to focus on how can we shift some equipment, how can we create an extra opening so there's a walk-up window where the DSPs, I'll refer to them all day, uh, will be able to access the food quickly so that they can get in their car and get to their guest, their consumer quickly. Wonderful. And Don, what are the uh, what's the best? Sorry, <laughs> what are the best ways restaurants um, to redesign their spaces to handle more of that off premise? I think, um, as Sean said, when we're seeing more delivery and walk up, you know, we have to think about uh, our how we're getting food out to our customers and and what that outside environment, outside pickup looks like. I think you know, in, in times of past prior to COVID and and it was sort of an afterthought. You know, we had a couple of parking spaces with some to-go signs and people just came up. And I think now that it needs to be fully integrated, it needs to be part of your brand, it needs to be, you know, what people are experiencing when they first arrive at your space. So it's something that needs to be well thought out at this point. We're, we're looking at drive-through, you know, fast casual, quick serve has been doing this for a long time, but now even fine dining needs to be thinking about how, how can I get my customer in and out and do I integrate a, a pickup window or a drive through window? And again, what does that look like for my brand from the moment my customer arrives to the, the point that they leave? Brian, we, we know that restaurants are mindful of keeping their staffs and their guests healthy. So do you feel as though restaurants should really put that in the forefront of the space or do you feel like it's more important for it to be kind of in the background? I think we have to be proactive instead of reactive, especially after what we've learned from this pandemic or this past pandemic. We do not know if there's, whether it's COVID-19 today or COVID-25 to come next. This isn't a scare tactic to talk about COVID-25, but realistically, we don't know. We have a Delta variant that's ahead of us, but we saw how this impacted us throughout the communities um, beyond you know, hospitals to nursing homes uh, and including restaurants. And so we have to prepare for the future and, um, you know, there are government dollars and programs out there to support you through PPP dollars for PPE, um, through CARES Act, and then the American Restoration Fund. But we feel confidently um, that there needs to be steps, proper steps, 
through indoor air quality. And uh, we know uh, this is a collaboration of what we're doing between the Galveston National Lab. The Galveston National Lab is the number one air biodefense lab utilized in the United States. We are also endorsed by Argonne National Lab. There are a lot of other products on the market being sold and told as a cure for indoor air quality, and it's not accurate. And so today, throughout our presentation, hopefully we can touch base on some of the science that's back with our product and our technology to make sure that you're making the right purchases and moving forward in the right direction. I, th I think for the audience, since they're probably not familiar with the product yet, maybe now's a great time where you can walk them through it. Absolutely. Um, a little bit about uh, IVP, the invention was through the collaboration, uh, the largest public-private partnership conducted in the state of Texas. Monza Harani, the founder, is a uh, medical builder. Uh, he builds uh, hospitals across the globe. Uh, but uh, this technology won an award, the Global Newsmaker of the Year, by Engineering News Record, and the top technology by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So as you can understand, you just don't come up with a technology and win, win awards uh, like this uh, without something that's truly revolutionized. These are our partners, University of Houston, University of Houston Superconductivity Center, the Galveston National Lab, and many others. Uh, the Galveston National Lab, uh, in partnership with the University of Houston, uh, Dr. Wu Chu is the founding director from the Superconductivity Center, one of our partners. Uh, Dr. George Crabtree uh, from the Argonne National Lab, who has endorsed this technology. And Kathy Banks from Texas A&M Engineering Station. Kathy Banks and her team helped us do thermal dynamic studies on aerosolized virus and endorsed by MIT, but what we did is that we studied live actual SARS-CoV-2. You are being sold and told about bac bac bacteriophage, which is synthetic, not live actual virus. And there are air purification products on the market with HEPA filters that do not stop this virus. In addition, we studied, and the slide won't move next, but we also studied anthrax spores. Uh, we did a five-fold increase in anthrax spores. We did, the, we did the increases to kill 100% of these viruses, both SARS-CoV-2 and anthrax spores, instantaneously in a single pass of air. So what is happening is that um, if you look on the market now, what's being sold or used, um, when, you, when you're utilizing HEPA, HEPA is the strongest filter on the market, right? So you may be using MERV 13, MERV 16, those are rock catchers. HEPA filters are used in, ho in hospitals. HEPA does not stop SARS-CoV-2. And if you go to our website at ivpair.com, you'll be able to see a lot of the scientific literature. Uh, but there's a, a study, particular study called the Nature Study. The Nature Study looked at the strongest filter being utilized, um, and that was HEPA. HEPA does not stop live actual SARS-CoV-2. And so what Monza Harani invented was a heated thermal HEPA filter. So if you can think of a club sandwich as restaurant people and foodies here in the room, three layers, bread, bacon, or turkey, same thing on a HEPA filter, HEPA paper, aluminum fold, and then metal mesh. What's unique about the metal mesh, we can get the image up here shortly, we'll, we'll take a look at it. If not, we'll, we'll, and I'll explain it. But in essence, the HEPA paper is doing its job to stop the tiniest particles on the, on the, in the air. HEPA filters stop up to 0.3 microns in size, and they capture 99% of aerosolized material. That's the problem, and that's where you're not being told the truth. HEPA filters stop 99% of the material up to 0.3 microns. Does anybody in the audience want to guess how, what size SARS-CoV-2 is? Point 0.1. So it's below 0 0.30 micron. Good guess, you're the winner of a new air purification system. There you go. But, um, and that's the key. And so with the metal mesh membrane, there's three things that are happening. And this is the unique part of the product. HEPA, number one, does its job to stop as much material as it can. The metal mesh is a tiny porous membrane in itself. So HEPA stops material, metal mesh stops material. The third and final component, we put electricity to the metal mesh. So we, just like in your kitchens, we cook and fry anything on the HEPA paper, we cook and fry anything on the metal mesh to kill, that's a catch and kill approach. So in hospitals, the nature study have shown that HEPA filters are actually super spreaders or super soakers. Air blows on that cellular structure, makes one into a thousand, 
breaks off, re-enters into the room, reinfects people. So what does that mean for you? People attending your restaurants could become infected because if you have HEPA air purification carts, because there's a lot of them being sold for money that's out there, um, you could be increasing the cause or the habit of that SARS-CoV-2 virus or any aerosolized virus. So I'll close with this. We killed anthrax spores. Killing anthrax spores, what does that mean? Um, you can kill any aerosolized virus in the air, including flu. So any virus, aerosolized virus or bacterium, we have the ability to, uh, to kill that. Just closing it out real quick, Materials Today Physics Magazine, we published our findings there, a catch and kill approach. Please, if you're going to buy mobile air purification carts or make any infrastructure additions to your buildings, everyone is talking that they'll, they'll say broad words about, if you look at the bottom of this slide, reduce, absorb, eliminate, and capture. Reducing and absorbing 99% of material is not catching and killing. So it's very important to catch and kill. And there's no technology on the market that does this. So Dr. Slobodan Pestler at the Galveston National Lab, one of our partners, uh, studied this with us, but said, let's kill anthrax spores. If you can kill anthrax spores, you can kill anything. This is a quick look at our mobile cart portfolio. We treat airs two ways, through mobile air purification carts, uh, the tall one is our V1 unit that covers 1,500 to 3,000 square feet. The middle one is about 800 to the R1, which covers 800 to 1,600 square feet. The T1 covers about 250 square feet or person-to-person, face-to-face -person, uh, -face interaction. So whether at a tabletop or at the uh, person seating uh, people in the front. And then we now have, not on this picture, is our wall unit, uh, which will be launched. Uh, it's being launched as we speak. And then you can meet with local commercial HVAC companies. We are working with Train here in the United States um, for retrofit HVAC of install to your uh, HVAC buildings. But we're part, you know, as we advance the science and the technology, um, we've, we're starting partnerships with Carrier, Train, Goodman, Honeywell, Cook, and all the other people around. But we can pause there for questions or whatever you Yeah, thank you so much for telling us about that. It's a pretty Pretty phenomenal invention. I mean, I think now is a good time. Is Does anybody have specific questions on that system? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? We, we can, depending on the size. So as you, as you evolve with a product, obviously it takes you time with R&D, just like any pharma pharmacological agent or, or a new product to the market. We have a 24 by 24 by 11 and a half inch depth filter and a 12 by 12 by six and a half inch depth filter. So where we're working at, we've partnered with Walt Disney. Walt Disney's done, done four technological partnerships in their lifetime, we're number four. Um, but when you look at, we're, we're look, utilizing the Wells-Riley equation. That was utilized in the measles pandemic in the 1960s. And it calculates a relative risk reduction score of uh, people becoming infected. Mask alone, three to 10% relative risk reduction, which isn't much. Um, and why I'm bringing this up, mobile carts provide about an 87 to 93% relative risk reduction because it's about person to person mitigation. Everyone in this room breathing virus, we are the people putting the virus in the air. Sneeze, cough, talk, musical instruments are choir. And those people in your restaurants are the one putting virus in your restaurants. And so it's the immediate air. Our air purification carts turn air four to six times per hour, eight to 10 times per hour. It's an aggressive engine doing what it's doing. So you have to impact the immediate air and that's through mobile carts. Now, virus can remain infectious for 16 hours and travel 26 feet. That's when it gets sucked into the HVAC ducts. It's a sticky glycoprotein substance. So it sticks on this HEPA filter. So it regrows, breaks off and re-enters into the room. So there is a dual approach that you want to look, with, look at. And so when you look at funding, we know that no one can bite this off all at one time. So we know that there's CARES Act dollars for PPE, for mobile air purification carts with HEPA. We just want to make sure that you're educated and aware that heated thermal HEPA is the approach through integrated viral protection. There is also language being developed or budgeting under the American Infrastructure Plan for, for HVAC infrastructure. So if we play into the timing of now, you can retrofit with mobile and then come in you know, month one, month three at a retrofit look because it is going to take us time to install the retrofit HVAC system. Do 
Do, would you need both the mobile carts and the integrated HVAC to be fully effective, or would, it's not well, necessary, but recommended? Okay. Number but, of people. If you look at the Wells Riley equation, number of people in a given room at the given time period is the most impactful thing you want to look at, and we can provide quantitative, not qualitative, data on mobile air purification carts, the number of people in that dining area, and outfit your dining area accordingly. And by the way, I'm an architect who designs restaurants, so that's why this is very interesting to me. Don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. And, and one thing to add to this from the architectural side, and I, you might concur with this, and the audience might as well from an architectural perspective, eventually the health department's going to look at this. It's going to be part of something that you're going to want to think about in your pre-planning. And I'm not sure how many operators and owners are in the room, but it's something that we're talking about internally from an architectural perspective because we are specking MERV 13 because that's what our engineers tell us to do right now. So just the awareness of new technology and as it's going to change once the health department takes over, and you know they will, uh, they'll, they'll be overseeing this. Yeah, we're seeing the same. So on that same note, Sean, have you seen when you're designing new restaurants that are coming kind of post-COVID time period, are clients are your clients concerned with wanting to space tables even if it's not even if it's not a requirement? Are they looking at how do we design spaces post COVID to make our guests comfortable? I, I laugh at this question because if you asked maybe six or seven months ago, I would say yes, absolutely. But if anyone ate out last night and felt that you had to make a reservation and you could get the four p.m. slot or the ten p.m. slot, I. I feel, and this is not researched, but I, I don't think people care as much. They just want to get back into an, a physical environment and start conversing and dining with people. Uh, they want that hospitality el element. That said, what I am seeing more, and I mean, we read about this every day, so I'm not saying anything hugely innovative here. Uh, fast casual going into the QSR sector. Uh, there was an article this morning from Retail Business News about, I think the clickbait tagline was, a thousand prototypes created in a year, and it's everyone trying to accommodate every level of consumer, whether they're dine in, dine out, grab and go, what, what it, whatever it might be. It's really looking at, and, and they're looking at that not only from the consumer's perspective, but also from a real estate perspective. Again, going back to the operators, I bet we all thought a year ago there's going to be tons of real estate available, but now you're looking at infill, you're looking at how can you take an Applebee's, cut it in half, and partner with your buddy to, to take over two spaces? Uh, it's a real struggle. So I think restaurateurs are, are more focused on how do we just buy a two by four? How do we, uh, how do we get something built somewhat quasi in budget? Where can I find real estate? Dot, dot, dot. And then where can I find people to work in my restaurant? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm seeing that. But the, the same table spacing, well. it's not as much of a concern. I, I thought the day of community tables would be gone but uh, they, they want to pack them in. Yeah, we're actually seeing the exact same thing. <laughs> People are just anxious to be out mm -hmm. and enjoy company of their friends and family. Um, you know, you made a good note talking about fast casual wanting to enter the QSR space. Don, have you seen clients that are wanting to transition their model, both from an operations and a design perspective to move into the QSR and to incorporate drive-throughs? No, I have. I, I, I've, some of my clients have had predominantly very large restaurants, very large dining rooms are now thinking about going to a smaller footprint. And certainly, as I mentioned before, you know, in integrating the quick serve model of the drive-through and, and how do we, you know, accommodate that. I'm also seeing a lot more thought put into outdoor seating as people, while they do want to be together, like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants to be outdoors now and people seem to feel more comfortable when they're outdoors. So patio seating has become a prime thing and then that falls into real estate and where can you do that? I mean. You know, in Texas, we're we're blessed that we're able to to accommodate for the patio. Places like New York and other areas don't have that space, the, the sidewalk seating, and what all that goes into for legalities and being able to do that. But so I'm seeing some of my clients wanting to go to a smaller footprint, but by the same token, they're wanting to enlarge their patio size. So they end up with the same size, same square footage. It's just how are we recompartmentalizing our square footage? So I think that's a lot what I'm seeing, you know, happen as, as I move through uh, post-COVID. So. Have you as well seen some of your clients move into the QSR space and, and how you had to redesign their footprint in order to do so? Well, I mean, there's, there were actually a lot of conversations before the pandemic even began about the service model. And again, it was to accommodate third-party delivery. Because when we look at who our guest is today, 
there's our direct consumer that our direct guest that's coming up to the point of sale, but many restaurant groups we know don't really put a focus on that third party delivery. And all COVID did was take something that was a 30% or 20% of our business has now turned it into 50%. I mean, when my, my parents who are in their mid seventies downloaded Uber Eats, I'm like, okay, well this thing's <laughs> probably going to stick. And, uh, uh, I, I feel like looking at the DSPs as a, as another guest, another consumer and how, and they're your brand ambassador. What are you going to do to cut out all the pinch points for them? I mean, like I, I have four kids, so we go to Red Robin a ton and their DSPs as they come in, they get to leave with French fries. I mean, those little, those little touch points puts a smile on their face. And if they're representing you in the field, you need to start looking on a, from a physical standpoint of what can I do to reduce the amount of time they're in and out of the restaurant so that they can make more money. The happier they are, the better they are when they're meeting your guests at their door, or, you know, front door. And that, that translates into pickup windows, yeah. se second uh, drive lanes, yep. uh, you know, uh, uh, geofencing for, you know, they, they know when you're pulling into the parking lot so they can fire the food and get it to uh, uh, hot and fresh. So we're working with a lot of uh, kitchen development and how do we shift the kitchen in a dual lines. I could talk about this all day long. I want to give the opportunity to the rest of the speakers to, to chat about it. You probably have a great perspective on this as well. And I, I'm seeing the same things you are. I mean, being that you and I are in the same industry, we're, we're running across those same things. But yeah, oh, this fly. Hello, fly. <laughs> Get that fly. Um, what are we doing about these flies? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, it's it's trying to make that division, as you say, for the third party and, and how do they get the food and how do they not be in the same place that the person who's coming to pick up their food and those that are going through the drive through So it's like, how you know, how are we redesigning for all of these mm -hmm. things that need to occur outside of our restaurants now versus mm -hmm. what's happening on the inside and then still serve our people that are on the inside wanting to dine. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing the same things, yeah. And Ashley, can I add one last thing to yeah, this? Yeah, uh, for the For the dining guest, we, we can't ever forget that that guest and I used to work on the retail side of the industry and I always used to tell my retail clients you need to look at restaurant clients you need to understand hospitality and uh, I, that's the one thing that our industry is really really good at it's about elevating that space so going back to the retailers there with the surgence of Amazon and distribution they really focused on their store environments making each retail space a special space to go so as you're building your brick-and-mortar locations uh, you know, we've talked about the prototype completely going away, and, and that's, that remains true. If you're going to invest in your in-dining experience, it needs to be special. And that, that really, really puts your, you know, your name out there of, like, I don't want to eat this at my dining room table. I want to come in, and I want to order the extra margarita or three or four. So uh, I, I never give up on the brick and mortar, please, because we're architects. Yeah, <laughs> right? definitely. And I think to, to add to that in terms of, of our need for hospitality at this point, we've all been so distanced from one another and you know not being able to get out. And now when you are out, you really want to experience that. So I think it, it lands a lot on your, you know, your staff and how you're being treated because you're now going out and people are really wanting to have that experience and want to enjoy themselves. So that, you know, coming away with that, so feeling like they're being treated well and, and even more so than before just because we've been distance for so long and now it's super important you know I want to go out and have a really good time and I really feel you want know, to feel like I was taken care of you know so I think it's super important even outside of the design and what's happening you know as, as owners and operators of your space you know how's your you know your staff and retraining your staff and and just having some empathy for people who have been locked up for so long so I think it's important so when you talk to, an, let's say, a new operator, an operator in existence that's looking to create a new brand or a new space, what do you think are some of the most critical points for them to consider when they're developing a new brand as far as the design goes? That's kind of, well, either one can, <laughs> can start. All right. Uh, I, I use a term uh, that's more relevant for, for retail, but when I'm talking to restaurant op operators, I, I use the word omni-channel. Is that anyone raise a hands know what know what that means? The short definition is really being a, able to accommodate every guest in at every touch point and be able to deliver your product, your food, uh, what 
in whichever way is going to accommodate them, uh, whether it's online channels, whether it's through a, via a ghost kitchen, via, uh, via the in-room dining experience. It's having every touch point figured out. And when I talk to new operators, uh, you know, people, owner operators, chefs that want to start their new space, you, you, you can't go into it just thinking about the brick and mortar and the menu. You have to look at your online presence. You, you're going to have to have partnerships with third party. You might consider ghost kitchens. You need to look at every aspect of the industry. And again, taking a little away from the brick and mortar architectural side of it, it's focusing on all of those online channels because I was in a discussion with somebody yesterday. I want to dine in. I miss people. I like my wife and I are here. We're going to try to hit every restaurant we can this evening. We love that experience. Uh, another person I was speaking to is like, when I come into the restaurant, I just want to order. I want my food quick and I want to get out of there. I, I do not like ordering from a smartphone in a restaurant. That's me. Somebody might. They might be time struggled. They might have kids that they've got to get to and they have 30 minutes to eat where I have, have an hour and a half. And when I use the Omni channel, it's being able to meet the needs of each of those consumers. So that's, that would be my advice for a new, new operator. Thank I think, you. I think to add to that in terms of the, you know, the, the, the QSR codes for menus and stuff, I think that's kind of here to stay. I mean, we, we're, that model is, is there. I think that it's, it's beneficial to those who do want to dine that way. It's also beneficial, I think, on the owner operator side. It's so much easier to update. You know, you're not printing a new menu every time. So if you're changing items on the menu or changing costs, it's very easy to do through that. Um, I personally like the, the ability to be able to use an app to pay without even having to put out my credit card. I like to be able to do that. So I think, you know, while we think of some of the, the positive things that may have come out of the pandemic, you know, we have this, these new, new ways of, of working through those issues. And I, I think um, this, you know, this, when I was here, uh, when I was at the hotel last night, and I went to, to order food, and, and there was an opportunity to either have a paper menu and or to scan and, and do it. So I like having that both. So I think, like you're saying, being omni-channel and, and touching um, all, all different facets of how you might order or, or take your food away. I think, I mean, there's still the same things about design, and you're asking the questions of, you know, what is your brand? You know, what, what, is, what is it that you're trying to say? To the world and in, in your design and, and that sort of thing, but I think there's a, a larger focus now on these other things than just what is my environment, what is the built environment. I think you have to go way past that, and I think as designers and architects, we have to think beyond the built environment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, Brian, when people are looking to incorporate the mobile units into their space, have you seen people incorporate them into the physical design when they're building new units? There, there are newer, the newer build-outs where we catch them early on before building. Yes, we're doing a lot of integration with not only restaurants, but with uh, hospitals, uh, prison centers. There was a, a very emotional story about a prison detention center in Detroit where four lives were lost. Uh, many people were sick through COVID. We, did, uh, we tested pre-COVID uh, measures and um, live COVID in the, in the prison centers itself, put our mobile carts in, removed 100% of COVID. They did not put one in the laundry room. We tested that laundry room, positive test for COVID. We then placed our machine in there and removed 100% of the COVID. Why I'm telling you that is that that led to their new development with, with the new build of their detention center. They installed, they're going to install the retrofit HVAC system. And so whether we're pulling out old equipment or putting in new, um, we're able to do both from, from, from that install perspective. I have a question for you, just thinking about the different size units and, and the sort of smaller tabletop units. Are you seeing a lot of that happening in what, existing restaurants at this point? When I dine, when I, I'm traveling a lot to create the education and awareness, and, and a lot of restaurants have the tabletop, not our T1, but we hope to they have other competitive devices that unfortunately is not the proper solution. Um, it's not a catch and kill phenomena. It's an absorber, so it's just sitting there festering more virus and putting it into the air. And so um, it's our goal to create the proper education awareness as quickly as it can. And as you know, marketing and education awareness is tough, you know? So Don, I think people would be curious to hear, where do you get your inspiration from with designing so many different brands and so many fun new concepts? Where does your inspiration come from? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I'm asked that a lot. Um, my inspirations usually come from my clients. You know, what what is what is their brand about? I, I love 
understanding every aspect of the restaurant from the restaurant owner, and that inspires me. Um, I, things in nature inspire me. Travel inspires me. I mean, all types of things inspire me. I can't say that there's one specific thing that inspires me every time or that I go, that's my go-to. I think um, the more I dine out, the more I meet people, and, and the more I see, the more things that inspire me. And I, I, I can't say that there's one specific thing. What about you, Sean? I, I like talking to chefs. I, I mean, I, I am such a food geek. I, my prior, prior to this uh, employment, I worked for a, a company called The Culinary Edge. And my favorite part of my job was going on food tours. And I'd take restaurant CEOs out into Manhattan, and we'd go to 30 restaurants and get to talk to the director of operations, director of culinary, see the space. And when we're in new opportunities architecturally, or even we're, we're not as accomplished as a design agency as Dawn's firm is, uh, but from a, from a kickoff, if the director of culinary is not in the room with the CEO, I don't want to have a meeting. Because that, that's, what you're, that's what you're selling. And the chair might be comfortable, but I love talking to chefs and hearing their passion about their menu. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's a wonderful way to look at it. So kind of on the lighter things, how important is Instagrammable moments and walls in the restaurant still? Is it still re relevant? Is it still required to have that space to be able to take pictures in front of? I, I mean, I guess, I guess. Oh I, I mean, you know, people are just like taking pictures of food simply because they're out now. I mean, so there's an Instagrammable moment, you know, at your table at this point. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, I went through a whole trend of where we had to have a specific wall and, and, and you know, you wanted to have the Instagrammable moment. So, you know, and I'm, I've read a lot of documents and such on, you know, Instagrammable moments are now, you know, need to be exterior. What is, you know, so that people are feeling more comfortable. But I, I mean, you know, I think that social media is part of our everyday life. And I think people, yeah, I mean, I think there's still Instagrammable moments, but I don't know that it needs to be a, a branded Instagrammable moment. I mean, my husband is constantly taking pictures of his food and he's not even in the industry, but you know, it's, it's just, he takes it and he, Maybe he shoots wants to it cook off. for you. Yeah, he does cook for me. He's an awesome cook. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's still the Instagrammable moment, whether or not it's a preconceived or predetermined. I'm, I'm not so sure about that anymore. You? I, I feel like it, it needs to be just more integrated in the overall uh, design versus just one unique moment. You want something that you can own, but a, a good case study for this. Uh, has anyone been to uh, Hotel Emma at the Pearl? I, you can't walk two steps without taking a selfie. I hate taking selfies, but I've got a thousand on my phone. Uh, that, that hotel is beautiful. There's moments throughout the entire space that, that I'm certainly going to be posting about it and talking about it and writing a book report about it. So I think it's absolutely important, especially as you see newer generations that are even more comfortable with technology come into the space. Yeah, everything's an Instagrammable moment. That's my point. It's like, you know, everything We're going to be on Instagram, Yeah, right? it needs to be Instagrammable, but, no, you know, not just one little area I've created for an Instagram moment. I mean, well, I think, and I think for us, you know, safety, return patrons, return customers, traveling the United States and going to some of these cities and not being able to go to a restaurant because they're still shut down. I don't, we're here in Texas and we see the impact here in Texas. But when you travel state to state and you can't get a sit down to eat, or they're closing at 9, 9 o'clock in restricted table seating. We, f we want to partner with everyone who utilizes our systems to say that these, your restaurant is safe and secure through utilization of integrated viral protection. And we will do that with our partners, but we want to help provide confidence. It's just like for schools. We want to, not only do these mobile cards provide optics, but they, it's an efficacy message. It's a true scientific efficacy, efficacy message. And so, um, you know, if I want to drop my children at school and I see this, or I see another air purification product, I know personally because I, I know the products. Um, but we want to provide that education and awareness through social media to bring the global economy back, and together we can do that. Well, we are. We're so blessed to be in Texas. I don't know if you all have traveled or not, but you know, I was in Philadelphia a few weeks ago, and, and, and the restaurant situation is so sad there. I mean, it's just. It's it, it it's a great thing to be living in Texas right now, especially You're for restaurants. Correct. I, 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 I mean, think we take it for granted. Sometimes yeah, it's, <laughs> that it's, we live in one it's of the best just, states, Yeah, we really do. It's amazing what we've been able to do, and that we're open, and that people are being able to go out and enjoy themselves. It's you know, 
just, and I, and I just think, thinking about that and how, how important that is. And you're right. It's just when you travel and see it, and that's where I think we have to be proactive versus reactive today because we do not know what's going to happen in October, August, September, and October. Flu season comes back. The Delta variant's out there. So, it, you know, we need to be proactive versus reactive in case something happens again. Brian and Sean, you both touched on technology in the restaurant space. You know, something that I, I think is kind of on the beginning edge is robotics in the restaurant space. So seeing robotics in the kitchen as well as I think on the floor today, I saw one of the robotics that actually delivers the foods, food to the table. Um, what have you guys seen as far as people integrating, you know, robotic arms in the kitchen or robotic delivery food methods? What have you guys seen in that space yet? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I, I, don't, I think robotics are not a gimmick anymore. It, it feels like there needs to be years of, of uh, further innovation and research for it to actually impact uh, sales growth and reduction of staff, whether that's something that we want or not. Uh, what, what I will say about robotics is just in the, the level of uh, innovation in kitchen equipment is another component of robotics. And, uh, there were a handful of people I see in the audience that were at the Ghost Kitchen conference several weeks ago, and I, I heard an interesting point about uh, focusing your, your energies and your dollars on um, state-of-the-art equipment while there's a cost to it might attract a more tech-savvy uh, associate or uh, staff member. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective. I mean, if you're hiring a 16-year-old, 17-year-old line cook uh, that might be in a STEM class, might be interested in coming into the food and beverage. And I know you are all struggling to find people to work in your restaurants, and we're losing them all to distribution centers. I think the kitchen efficiency is increased by the quality of the equipment, uh, the digital interface of that equipment, uh, and in the long run, just create a better product and p possibly reduce uh, staff costs. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that, about attracting associates who are really interested in the tech portion of it. That's right. a, really, a really cool side of it. For us, technology will be big as well because we'll be inter introducing air particulate counters, air particulate sensors inside of filters. So through our collaboration and partnership with Honeywell, Honeywell and other major filter companies, we are looking at putting you know, control mechanisms inside of filters. So. We, we all have to keep up with technology whether we like it or not. And you know, us entering into the HVAC space, we are doing that to where data will be, and it's through Google and Ring and other people, where data will be reported back to a live cell phone, back to a desktop about your air particulate and, and what that means uh, to the indoor air quality and the environment that you're in. Don, how important do you think it is for graphic design and interior design to collaborate in the process when, when creating a new design space. Very important. I think a lot of people don't think about that. I think um, when you talk to a, a, an owner, when you talk to them about brand and, and their thought is, well, I already have a logo. And I think that there's so much beyond a logo for brand. The brand is who you are. Brand is what you represent. And I think it's super important to understand that brand and work with a brand company or graphic designer who understands that and integrate it early on with with interiors, it sometimes will end up being so disjunctive it becomes an afterthought. So I think you need to plan for those types of things and I think it's great to have the full team together to do that. I mean, I think just as you were talking about having a chef present at a meeting, I think it's important to have the chef and all of that, you know, the, the operator, the chef, the staff, the, you know, your, and then all your design professionals, whether it's the MEP engineer or the brand, but graphics, I, I think it's super important that it, it happens at the beginning that you integrate work together. How do you think about that point? I, I used to work for a brand strategy firm, and if you if you don't have all of those components together, you have a fractured brand. So yeah, graphic design, culinary, uh, interiors, engineering, all have to have to work together, or then it's inconsistent. Yeah. When you look at the logo of a, of a brand, how important is that to have it on the packaging, to have it on the uniform? Where do you think that it's gone overboard and where do you think that it's not enough? Where is that line? I'll, I'll just say this. If I weren't in this field, I would, be, uh, I would do innovation for packaging. 
and and, and I, I mean commission checks will be coming in all day long. I think for that for that industry, I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and packaging, and of course having your brand as part of that, especially for those that are dining out. That's that's how you're going to gain market share. Packaging's absolutely key, and having your brand be represented on that is is key. I think it goes beyond just the logo, as you were saying. How important is it to have the logo on everything? It's it's your uniform, your your appearance, your brand may not just be is not just tied up in that logo. So it's everything ab about what you're doing that that creates your brand. So while it's important to have your name and your logo on things, it's also important to establish what your brand is throughout, without just the logo. It has to be something that's recognizable with or without the name. So. Well, I can, I can relate to brand here. If you look at the slide, it's probably hard to tell the IVP brand, but when I go back, if I can go back, I can't go back. <laughs> I would take you to my main slide with the IVP brand, but it, it's, you're right, branding is everything, and it's the, return, the ROI on the total concept. So the million-dollar question for each of you, where is restaurant design going? What is, what is the future? What is the next five, ten-year outlook for restaurant design? You're starting. Oh, I'm sorry. We're starting this. We're going what is the next? Right. What, what is what is the restaurant future look like? Um, I mean, I can't say that it's 100% different than it has been. I think it's moving in a direction where we're thinking about things, as we've said, safety. What, what's going to be? You know, what's going to come out of this for health department? What is that going to be? Um, you know, where where is technology being integrated? You know, specifically, uh, what? How are we going to be? approaching delivery, pickup, third-party delivery, those things are super important in design. Um, I think it's also still very important as it's been for years to, to think about the hospitality, what the environment is, what the built environment, does someone feel comfortable in that environment? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's not too different from today. I just think that we're, we're looking at some things that we need to to address in terms of flexibility, you know, what happens if you're saying, if we, we have a COVID-25, you know, how flexible is our space? Can we, can we accommodate separating tables? Can we accommodate bringing tables together? You know, what are we doing within the space that makes it easy so that you're not, I think there was such a situation where you know, when we did this six foot apart and, you know, what do we do and where, how do we accommodate? And, you know, you said Plexi went up and, you know, we had things that just maybe weren't the most aesthetic looking things to, to do at that point, but we had to do it. So I think now understanding what, what we may or may not have to do again in the future is to, to plan for that as we design so that it is flexible so that you can accommodate that easily without having to rearrange your entire restaurant or you walk in the door and there's you know 20 tables in the corner because we can't use these tables and how are we accommodating for this? Because you, we just need to be flexible and I think that so the future of design in my opinion um, is flexibility and adding the, you know, all of this safety issues and, you know, the, that sort of thing as we move forward. I always assume that this question is going to come up <laughs> and I have the answer. Ah. I, I, I can't like look past five years. I always look like a year or two ahead and taking ghost kitchens and third party delivery out of the conversation. A lot of the brands that we're talking about that are much smarter than I am are, are talking about synergies that they can create with other brands. You know, I, I, I do, I have a couple friends that work at a, the brand Velvet Taco, and they're always looking at what's another brand that we could partner with, share a space, and create some sort of breakfast, lunch, dinner opportunity. So I see just, again, going back to the available real estate, and I mentioned the Applebee's or the, the major franchisees that through the pandemic, market share was already dropping, it's dropping a little bit more. Some of those spaces are becoming available, they're on Main and Main. You can put two restaurants into a space like that and potentially a third kitchen in the back where you're doing some sort of uh, virtual kitchen uh, out of the space. So I would say a trend, that, a trend, not the future of restaurant design, is that symmetry between brands and like, again, a Velvet Taco and a Snooze AM eatery, where they have similar customer base, but it can lead the whole day part, so you have, a, you have a destination to go to. So I see that as a future, we'll call it a future trend. I was caught, my business partner and I, who here, my business partner's here with me today, but we were caught in a cycle of acquisition of a major food manufacturing plant during the run-up of COVID. Bank lending stopped, but 
to see the impact from the food supply at schools once the schools shut down, then the restaurants shut down. There was an excess of amount of food in the supply chain and bulk packed. And so us being in the retail sector, we saw the rush of food, food service pack going into retail to deplete, deplete the, the supply chain. Um, once that was depleted, you know, then we're, all the grocery stores were absorbing the brunt. And so when you see this total catastrophic you know, meltdown of the, glo of the global food supply demand and just the supply chain itself, it was, it was heartening. And you know, we, we couldn't get our food production facility off the ground. And now what we're looking at to try to get it off the ground to sustain our current retail model is you know, shared space. You know the shared food kitchens that you're talking about, um, but I think it's you know it's eye-opening. And, and when you look at, we're talking with Tyson and major food manufacturers with our air purification systems, because these food plants are being shut down. When you have a global shutdown or a regional shutdown on a Tyson meat plant, it affects our other business, where you can't get pork or beef supply to supply your product. Um, but the, you know, and that's why we're we're talking about indoor air quality, you know, from ground level at slaughterhouses, at food production lines, at Tyson, and what have you, so that we're not hindered uh, in the future. I'm going to end on a fun question, then we'll open up to the audience to see if they have any questions, but what's one restaurant design that you've seen in the last year or two that you were just incredibly impressed, or you thought it was extremely innovative, or anywhere in the world? <laughs> You, you have to go first. I have to. I have to look at it. I have to go to Instagram really quick and look <laughs> and look it up. So, Dawn, please. I don't know if I have an answer for that. Most innovative restaurant. Hmm? Gosh, I don't, I don't know. I really can't answer that question. I mean, I, every place I go is so innovative and fun, and I love. I'm a foodie, so I love going. I, I, I don't have one that I would say is, stands out in my mind. A couple weeks back, I went to a restaurant in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, called uh, Hugo's Invitados. Anyone been there? Just a, a beautiful, beautiful culinary, incredible hospitality, uh, and and then the the design. I, I have a thousand pictures of it. But one thing I thought was interesting, and I don't know if this was pre-pandemic or or uh, they separated the tables with highly decorated mannequins. And it oh, just creates it created yeah. some space, and I'm like, well, that's a unique way to create some level of distance. Uh, but again, I said I have this passion for for you know the chef, the culinary side, and uh, I I highly recommend it. And I just thought they did an incredible job of space separation, how they plated the food, the packaging, every every touch point was was incredible. Very cool. What about you, Brandon? I don't know if I can help out there. I I can tell you where. Zinc and Boudreaux here in San Antonio where they've adopted our technology. I'm always, you know, it's cool to see your technology in action. Um, and so that's, you know, some of the highlighted ones here. But as, you know, again, as you travel, uh, as much as we've been traveling, it's, it's, it's hard to watch these restaurants that just aren't full functioning. And so any way that you can improve the appeal to bring the consumer in is, is key. So. Excellent. Well, are there any questions today from the audience for any of the panelists? Can I yeah. Oh. So my question is, um, you know, that we, we all know really well how small, slim the margins are for restaurants to begin with. And so the, the biggest question that comes to mind for me is as technology increases and we have a need for you know, different protocols for sanitation and safety based on advanced technology. Um, what is this doing to the cost of building out a restaurant now? Well, I think when you look at a, a retrofit HVAC system or a program, it's added equity to the building. So it all becomes who owns the property, who owns the physical asset, who's leasing. There are lease options available, uh, particularly with our systems and I would think with other technologies to where you can lease into a dollar buyout. Cash flow is king, right? It's a day-to-day -day operation and how you manage that cash and how you're going to pay for these new technologies. But uh, I would definitely look into the leasing options that are out there, incorporating that into your cash models. Um, and then do not hesitate. Reach out to us and look uh, at sba.gov for EIDL loans, the restaurant revitalization programs. I don't know if you're familiar with those. 
there is a significant amount of dollars that are available today for not only PPE, but you know, to help re revitalize restaurants, uh, revitalize um, the um, venue, venue restoration programs, uh, so shuttered venue. Uh, but the programs are there. The, the paperwork is a little tedious but, and never fun, but uh, that's my thought. Emily, to your question about cost, I mean, we're in this place now where materials are hard to find, and so cost of, cost of building anything, schools, restaurants, any, any type of built environment is super expensive right now. I, I don't think it's going to stay this way forever, but currently that's where we are. I think, Sean, you mentioned just finding a two-by-four right now. You know, people are looking for that. The price of foam for furnishings has gone off. Lead, lead times have gone off the charts from, you know, used to be able to get a chair in four or six weeks and now it's taking 24, 26 weeks to get tables and chairs. So it's it's pushing that. And when you think about the restaurant owner who, you know, in, in past, and, and this has been my life, so you go in and you have X amount of days to try to build out your, your free rent or your whatever you're looking at and, and what you're trying to fit your timeline into. I mean, timelines are just crazy right now. It's very difficult. And um, so it, it, I don't think it'll stay this way, but, but right now, today, it's, it's way more expensive to build. It's taking way more time to do it. Um, and hopefully these things will ease up. But it, it, it's something that has to be considered, especially when you're thinking about the ROI. And you know, I always say that's a lot of tacos. You know, you're spending $1.2 million to open a space. How many tacos do I have to sell to just get even with that? And that doesn't take into effect your, your staffing and your you know, food in the refrigerator and your, the real estate that you're having to pay for and all of those other things. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll eventually start to see things normalize a little bit. I mean, we're already seeing the price of, of plywood and such come down a bit. Um, I just think we're in this zone right now where it's super expensive, so. And just in, in short, in terms of your investment dollars going in, when I'm talking about state-of-the-art kitchen equipment, it'd be best to invest in really the online uh, uh, interface of, of how you can uh, mobile order versus the state-of-the-art equipment if you're using your funds to the best of their ability. And have everyone read your LOI. I know there's a lot of savvy operators here, but have your architect read it, have, have your best friend read it. Uh, have your broker read it. <laughs> have, have, it, have everyone read it to see if you can leverage, uh, you know, the landlords want you to be successful. And if you want to do a pop-out window for, for pickup, have them pick up that charge. Uh, so really look at your design as it relates to the letter of intent to see if uh, you can have the landlord pick up any of those costs. I have a question for you then, um, because what I'm seeing with landlords right now is that they are being a lot more considerate and allowing these types of things, where maybe before they wouldn't do the drive through or they wouldn't let you put a window in. I mean, I'm working with a, a client right now, we're doing a space, and the amount of things that they're agreeing to is amazing to me, where before it would be no, no, no. Are you seeing more leniency in that? As a, uh, on the broker side? Yeah, so as, as commercial real estate brokers doing the LOIs for the restaurants, mm -hmm. we're seeing it a little bit more, but at the end of the day, the conversation about how it's going to take a lot longer today to get this restaurant open is just not an easy one. So um, it's a hard conversation to have, and then we keep adding on to that. So we are looking for provisions to be able to terminate our lease if I can't get staff now, or terminate our lease or not pay rent if there's a, um, a COVID you know, resurgence and things have to close down. So, like, but like you know better than anybody, both of you, it's, if it's not ADA compliant, if it can't be within code, then no, they're not, you know, we're not. They understand, but there's, no, not too much. I think, I think when you're looking at safety, you know, and it, this is something to keep in mind, and too, we want consumers coming back. We want our children going to school. We want our nursing homes protected. We want mom and dad to go out and eat and hit restaurants and keep coming back. Um, these PPE dollars that are out there are, in essence, free. They're forgivable loans for PPE, and it's creating that education and awareness. But we want to make sure that the right systems are being put in place so that, you know, they came out with UV and ionization. People spent millions of dollars on that and millions and it's durated it's not kill it's durated catch or a durated absorbency it's not a catch and kill phenomenon so we and we can get into the science and the weeds and all of that with you but um, 
you know, just making sure you're making the right purchase paths and helping people with education awareness around that. Excellent. I think that wraps up our session this morning. Brian, Sean, Don, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you guys all for joining. Enjoy the rest of the day at the show.